Welcome to another episode of the True Crime Tales. Today, we are going to be talking about Jordan Brown. Jordan was born on August 12, 1997, in New Beaver, Pennsylvania, to his father, Chris, and his mother. From the beginning, Chris and Jordan were extremely close, Chris was everything to Jordan. He really looked up to him, and vice versa. Jordan was everything to Chris. He was his whole world, and he loved being a single father. Not that he loved being single because that has a lot of challenges, but he loved being a father. He didn't mind the fact that he had to do it by himself because he loved having a son so much. Jordan grew up in an area of New Beaver known as Wampum. This is a very rural area that's about 40 miles north of Pittsburgh. It's a very small town with less than a thousand people living in it, and this area is a very outdoorsy type of area. People who live there are into hunting, fishing, and water sports. There's a river that runs right through it, it's very heavily wooded, so people love to go off-roading through it. You know, it's just a very rugged kind of small-town feel. Jordan's upbringing was apparently completely normal, nothing out of the ordinary had ever happened to him, and nothing stood out to anybody as a red flag with him. His dad said that he had the all-American childhood and that he was happy and loved. He played baseball and football growing up, he was even the quarterback of his peewee football team, the Warriors. Chris was actually the coach of this team, so it was a great bonding experience for the two of them, and clearly, they were incredibly close. He was just a pretty normal partner in everyday life. Eventually, he reconnected with someone that he had known when he was younger, named Kenzie Hauk. Kenzie was also a single parent, so they really connected on that because there's just so much that they could relate to. She had two young girls, Janessa and Evelyn, and people who knew Kenzie said that she was a very fiery and fun personality. She was beautiful. She was described as funny, engaging, and caring about the ones she loved. According to her family, from a very young age, she knew she wanted to be a mom. She was one of those kids who was constantly talking about one day when she'd be a mom. And she really loved her daughters. When she came into Jordan's life, she showed that same love to him. Kenzie and Chris started by dating, and when that went smoothly for a while, they decided to move in together. This is obviously a big step, because of the blending families. There are a lot of emotions, I'm sure, that had gone into it. But overall, everyone seemed really happy with the change. They actually moved into this really cute little farmhouse, and it seemed as if their family was doing great with the whole blending thing. The kids were really getting along. Not only that, but her girls loved Chris, and Jordan really liked Kenzie a lot. He even started calling Kenzie mom because his real mother wasn't even in his life. Kenzie's family says that she loved Jordan, that she would bend over backwards for him. She was really nice. I liked her a lot. She bent over backwards for him. She had a good relationship with him. Eventually, after they had all moved in together and things had kind of settled, they got pregnant with a child together. This was very exciting for the whole family. The kids were excited to have a new sibling. Chris and Kenzie were excited to see what their child would be like together. They had recently found out that they were going to be having a baby boy, and they were going to name him after Chris. His name was going to be Christopher. And, like I said, everyone was super excited about this, but especially Jordan because he had always wanted a brother. He was so excited to be a big brother and could not wait until the baby was born. I was happy. I was always wanted a little brother. And that's, that's what, uh, it was a boy. So that's what I was going to get. So, by February of 2009, Kenzie was eight and a half months pregnant, almost ready to give birth to her new son, Christopher. 
That brings us to February 20, 2009. That morning, Chris said he woke up a little bit late, so he kind of had that frantic late for work vibe going on. And Kenzie, as you know, she was close to having the baby. She's eight and a half months pregnant, and she actually asked if Chris could stay home that day, but he insisted that he had to go to work. He had to be there that day, and he said that he regrets that to this day. Kenzie was really not feeling great that day, so she was still in bed. Chris went in and kissed her goodbye and headed off to work, just like any other normal day. During this time, Kenzie was sleeping in the downstairs basement of the house, and Jordan's bedroom was upstairs. But after the baby came, they were planning to switch rooms so that she could take care of the baby upstairs. This was going to be happening pretty soon. In fact, Jordan had already moved his clothes to the downstairs bedroom that Kenzie was sleeping in that morning. According to Jordan, this was a normal morning for him as well. His stepsister, Janessa, actually woke up for school. He started getting ready like any other day, he got out of bed, went downstairs, and went to the room where his clothes were, which is where Kenzie was sleeping, the bedroom he was going to be moving into. He grabbed his clothes and went into the bathroom to change for school. After this, he and Janessa were just sitting on the couch together, relaxing before they caught the bus for school. When the time got closer for them to leave, Kenzie actually told them to go ahead and leave so they wouldn't miss the bus. They went out of the house like normal out the back door and down the driveway. The bus just picked them up right in front of the house, and they were on the bus by 8.15, like normal. Adeline was too young to go to school, so she was still home with Kenzie. Then, around 9 a.m., some tree trimmers arrived at the house to do some work on the property. According to them, they just got to work, started trimming trees. And then they looked over and saw that there was a little girl standing in the front door of the house, hysterically crying. The tree trimmer who noticed this was concerned, obviously, and walked over to her. As he got closer, he realized that she was crying and screaming, My mom is dead. So this guy tried to comfort her and immediately called 911. The police got there very quickly, and they went into the house. They found Kenzie still in bed with blood all over. Initially, they thought that she had just hemorrhaged. It wasn't until the coroner came in and actually started touching her body and looking closer that they realized that this was a murder. Kenzie was only 26 years old, and she had been shot in the back of the head execution style in her bed. And, of course, that means her son Christopher was also murdered. They tried to revive her, but there was nothing they could do. The police called Chris. He had only been at work for a little while, he had just seen Kenzie, kissed her goodbye in bed, and then he found out that she was dead. Someone had shot her inside their home. They didn't tell him exactly what had happened, they told him that there was a horrible accident and he needed to come home. At that point, he rushed back home, and when he got there, they told him that Kenzie was gone, and so was his unborn child. Chris was devastated, understandably, and collapsed to the ground. They told me that she and the baby were gone, and I remember collapsing in the yard, I lost it. They said that Chris was just stunned, he was in complete disbelief that this could happen. Of course, they thought maybe Chris did it, so they immediately brought him in for questioning. I gave her a kiss, told her I loved her, she kissed me back, and I left. But obviously, once they talked to Chris, they were able to rule him out as a suspect pretty quickly. You know, he actually went to work, there's proof that he was at work during all of this, and they even checked his hands for gunpowder residue, and there was none. They immediately went to Jordan and Janessa's school, pulled them both out of school, and brought them into the police station. Both of them said that it was a normal morning except for Jordan. 
He noted that there was a black truck outside of his house that he did not recognize. He knew that they had people coming and working on their house, so he thought it was just one of their trucks. But he also noted that Jordan and Janessa were obviously devastated to hear about what had just happened to Kenzie. I mean, this was shocking, they had just seen her, they had just said goodbye and left for school for the day. All of them were just in absolute shock. They went home that night and tried to be together as a family, starting to cope with this stunning death. So, they were all cuddling together. Chris said that he and Jordan fell asleep in each other's arms, just crying terribly sad. And he said, by some miracle, I think they were so exhausted and just shocked that they fell asleep. But they were only asleep for a little while before the police came back to their house and started pounding on the door at 3.30 in the morning. Chris went downstairs, answered the door, and was really concerned but hoping that they had some answers for him. But when they opened the door, they said they had an arrest warrant for Jordan, who was 11 years old. They took him from the house, and Jordan was half asleep, so confused, and traumatized by this day. He had absolutely no idea what was going on, had no understanding of what was happening at all. Chris said that he was super confused, his son being considered a suspect in Kenzie's murder hadn't even crossed his mind. They took him, at 11 years old, down to the police station, interviewed him a bit, and then took him to the county jail with the adults. The police said that they were confident they had enough evidence that Jordan killed Kenzie before he went to school that morning, in a jealous rage about the newborn baby. And then they took me straight to the county jail, and I had no idea what was going. I wasn't with anybody, it was just a bunch of strangers. I didn't understand what was happening, I didn't know where I was at, like what was going on or anything. Chris, as you can imagine, was absolutely blown away by this. Like I said, this had never crossed his mind. He was mind blown. Jordan and Kenzie had never had issues in the past, he never knew his son to be violent or aggressive towards Kenzie in any way. So, he was completely stunned that this was happening. Now, you're probably wondering, what evidence do the police have that this 11-year-old shot his stepmother and then went to school like nothing happened? The first bit of evidence that police said pointed to Jordan was the fact that Kenzie was shot with a single shotgun. They said that this was more of a crime of opportunity. Like Jordan saw the gun available, saw that Kenzie was there, saw his dad wasn't home, and decided to do it all at once without thinking about it much. Because this is really not an ideal weapon to use to murder someone when you fire off a shotgun, the bullet breaks up into a bunch of little pieces so it's not often used in murders. So, I figure this is a mistake that a kid would make, they wouldn't think this through very well. They also believed that this was a gun that was in the house, it was not something that a stranger walked up carrying a huge, long rifle up to the house in broad daylight and did this. That just didn't make sense to them. But Chris owned a lot of guns. There were plenty in the house that Jordan could have used. They had guns of all shapes and sizes, they were super into hunting, and they also had a ton of ammunition. They even found a child-sized shotgun that was a gift to Jordan for Christmas, which he used for hunting. This is something that's very common, especially in areas like this. Many young people who live around heavily wooded forestry areas learn how to hunt when they're pretty young, so this isn't anything strange for this area. When police were on the scene, they noticed that the small gun belonging to Jordan seemed to still smell like it had been recently fired. Now, all this clearly doesn't necessarily prove that Jordan was the one who did it or that the gun even was used. But the other thing they were really going off of was the fact that Jordan had changed his story when they interviewed him. The first time they interviewed Jordan, he said that there was a black truck outside of their house in the driveway, and he thought it was just someone working on the house. The second time they interviewed him, he said that there was someone in the truck, wearing a hat and ducking down. 
Now, it's totally possible he could have just recalled more details, it could be possible he's recalling things wrong. But apparently, this was enough for the police to prove that he's a liar and that he did this. It's kind of crazy, I mean, he's 11 years old. How many kids do you know that change their stories when they tell a story over and over? You know, multiple times, how often do the details change? Pretty much always. They also brought up the fact that Janessa's interview was different than her first interview. This was a big deal because when they interviewed Janessa a second time, she said not only did she see her brother messing around with the guns that morning, but she also heard a big boom before they left for school. However, she completely left this out of the initial interview. Now, to this day, Jordan swears that he never touched the guns that day, but the police believed otherwise. They said that it was jealousy of the baby that would be coming into the family that drove Jordan to kill Kenzie and the baby. In my opinion, jealousy of the impending birth. Police started talking a lot with Kenzie's family, and they had quite a lot to say about Jordan. To this day, they have a lot to say about Jordan, and they believe 100% that Jordan killed Kenzie that day. They said that Jordan wasn't the happy kid that everyone describes him as. That he seemed to be more of a troubled kid, that had some dark underlying issues. He just seemed like he was a troubled kid. He just seemed like he wasn't, like, a real happy kid. I, I don't get it. The police said that was some of their evidence. They also had taken a ton of Jordan's clothes from the house that day, and they had found some gunpowder residue on some of the clothes. However, Jordan had just attended this turkey shoot a couple of days before, and he was wearing the same thing, so it easily could have been from that. Police ended up finding three 20 gauge shell casings outside of the house, and one of them was found adjacent to the driveway in perfect condition. Police brought up that it's a little odd because when they had an interview with Jordan the second time, he talked about putting his hand into his pocket and pulling some lint out of his pocket, throwing it on the driveway before he got on the bus. Police believe that he was talking about the shell casings. Have a shotgun blast at the back of the head, it's consistent with the 20 gauge shotgun shell. I have a 20 gauge youth model in his room. It smells like it's recently fired and he's got gun residue uh, on him. I, I think that's at this point is more than enough. Chris, from the beginning, said that there was no way his son had done this. He never believed that. He said there had to be another explanation that Jordan would never kill Kenzie. He loved her. He was excited about having this baby in his life, and he never knew his son to be violent. I know my son, and I know if I ask him a question if he's lying to me or not. An 11-year-old couldn't plan their own birthday party, let alone, you know, to think that they could do something like that. Chris ended up telling the police that there was another person who he thought possibly could have been involved, and his name is Adam Harvey. Adam was Kenzie's ex-boyfriend of six years and Chris said that Kenzie was terrified of Adam. And get this, Kenzie even had protection orders against Adam, that's how scared she was of him. He had been really aggressive towards her in the past, he had made threats towards her. He said that he would kill her and her whole family, and that's how she was able to get that restraining order. And here's the kicker, Adam drives a black truck. Now, Jordan would have no knowledge of this, he had no idea who Adam was, definitely had no idea what car he was driving. The fact that he brought that up in the first interview is hugely important. The police went and checked out Adam, but from the beginning, they were pretty sure it wasn't him. The first reason they say it could not have been him is because when they checked his truck, it still had snow on top of it. They think that there's no way he could have driven 20 miles to Kenzie's and 20 miles back and still have snow on top of his truck. And here's something really interesting, when they first started talking to Adam, they realized that he had just found out some new information about Kenzie. For years, he was under the impression that he was the father of Adeline. But it turns out that he was not, and he had just found this out. 
He even expressed to the police how hard this was on him and how devastated he was to find this news out. So, could this have been a reason that he would want to kill Kenzie? But Adam was really cooperative with the police, very friendly with them, and he did a polygraph test. It wasn't long before they ruled him out as a suspect completely. They said that there was just no way, it all would have worked out. There was a chance that Adam didn't even know where Kenzie lived, and if he did, he would have to have this time so perfectly. They said it would have been impossible for him to know that the doors were unlocked, that she was home alone, other than with Adeline, and to know that there was a 20-gauge shotgun in the house. They also said that with all the guys out there trimming the trees, it would be impossible for him to get into the house without being seen, shoot her, and leave without any of them noticing. So, Adam ended up being ruled out as a possible suspect. This means Jordan was the only suspect, and they decided to move forward with his conviction. Meanwhile, while he's awaiting trial, he's being held at a juvenile detention center around 200 miles from Chris's house. Chris is driving four hours to see his son as often as he can. From the beginning, he is convinced that Jordan is innocent. There's no way that he killed Kenzie, he loved Kenzie. He would never do this to him. I mean, he loved his dad so much. If there was one person he loved in the world, it would be his dad. Why would he want to take away his dad's child, his brother, his possible stepmom? He's going to have one. Why would he do this to himself? It just did not make sense. Chris said from the beginning, he would ask Jordan, you know, you can tell me. I am your dad. Just be honest with me. And he was always like, 100%, I did not do it. I would never have shot Kenzie. The two of them were hoping that he would be found innocent in a court of law. Now, it's crazy in this case, and what I don't understand about the justice system is that some states work completely differently than others. But especially when it comes to juvenile crimes, in Pennsylvania, murder is not considered to be a juvenile crime. Anyone who is being tried for murder is tried as an adult. Jordan was going to be tried as an adult at age 11. I just don't understand. I personally believe that all children should be tried as children, and adults should be tried as adults nationwide. But that's my personal opinion. So, this case did pick up some media attention, but not the way I think it should have. Because this was just crazy. If he was convicted, Jordan would be facing life in an adult prison without the possibility of parole. And he would be the youngest ever to be sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. In my opinion, there was just not nearly enough evidence to make that call. This was obviously so hard on Jordan mentally, to be away from his family, to be convicted of murder, to be carrying around that guilt when you know he may not have even done it. And then it was also hard for Chris because he's trying to be there for his son, but he's also trying to mourn the loss of Kenzie and his unborn child. But he had to stay strong and be there for Jordan making sure he didn't end up in prison for the rest of his life for a murder he may not have committed. Sadly, Chris ended up losing his job because he was constantly having to leave to drive to this prison to see his son. Losing his job obviously took a huge toll on him financially. Just having to go back and forth and travel, that all costs money. This was an incredibly hard time for him. And Jordan, as you can imagine, was extremely stressed out and scared. As an 11-year-old in jail with people who were much older than him, I mean, he had 17-year-olds around him that were violent, that were getting into fights. He was seeing all kinds of stuff, hearing all types of language that you shouldn't at that age, and genuinely felt scared for his life every day. I didn't understand anything at all about what was going on. 
I didn't understand anything at all what was going on. He'd say, Dad, he said, I, you wouldn't believe what I've seen today. One kid threatened to stab another one in the neck, you know, while we were eating. The time went by in jail for Jordan, and eventually, on his 12th birthday, his dad got his whole, old football team to come to the jail and celebrate with him. And Jordan said that meant the absolute world to him at the time, to see everybody. I can't imagine, he said. Like the best day I ever had, because <laughs> I haven't seen my friends in so long, and you know, they all came up and we were there for a couple hours. Getting ready for this trial took a really long time, so Jordan spent years in juvie. Eventually, he started taking some classes, but he said that he was mostly self-taught. Jordan also loved to read. He got super into reading at this time, especially fantasy books, you know, the ones that were like diving into a different reality when you open them. Anything to get him out of the reality he was in. I can't imagine how stressful and traumatic it is as a kid, especially if you didn't do it. I mean, the trauma from that alone would be so heavy for a child. Then you'd think that maybe with some time, Jordan would eventually come around and tell the truth if he really did, you know, kill Kenzie. But to this day, Jordan swears that he never did anything to hurt Kenzie, that he never would have, and that he loves her. He still does, he still cares about her. He could not believe what happened, and all of them wished so badly that they could reverse this and go back to the family and the life they were all supposed to live together. However, on the other side, Kenzie's family was completely convinced that Jordan did murder Kenzie, that he had a dark side to him that Chris was not willing to see. I'm hoping he's going to be charged as an adult because that's what he is. He did an adult crime. Jordan's a murderer. And I'll say it. And his father needs to get in the mirror every morning and look in that mirror and say, I am the father of a murderer. I know some people are going to think that Jordan actually did this. It just doesn't make sense any other way. And, of course, when you hear Kenzie's family talking about how sure they are that Jordan did it, it makes you kind of wonder. They seem to be absolutely convinced, and they wanted Jordan to receive the maximum punishment possible. This was going to mean that Jordan would have to be tried as an adult, but they are still arguing about this. So, it wasn't until August of 2011 that a judge finally ruled that Jordan would not be tried as an adult. When you're tried as a juvenile, it's a much different process. There are a lot of different things in place. The following year, in 2012, they had the trial, and it actually only lasted three days. It was actually going to be a bench trial meaning the judge would be making the final decision, there's no jury. And on April 13, 2012, at only age 14, Jordan was found guilty of double homicide. This definitely riled up the community. I mean, people just did not think there was enough evidence to be sure that Jordan did this. Jordan's defense team felt like it was very unfair. They were convinced the judge got it wrong and that there was just not enough evidence to prove that Jordan did this. They decided to take this all the way to the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania. One of the biggest things that the police argued about was the fact that they had smelled one of the guns when they had first gotten to the scene, the small children's shotgun, and that it smelled like gunpowder. But they ended up finding out that the police who said this had absolutely no training or expertise when it comes to determining if a rifle had been shot. They said this cannot be used as evidence. They also argued about the shell casing. They said that it just did not make sense to rule that the one they had found was the one that was used in Kenzie's death because this family shot guns off on their property all the time. There were shell casings all over the place. They couldn't necessarily prove that that was the one from her death. And when you're talking about someone's life in prison, for a 14-year-old, you got to be sure you've got to have a lot better evidence than that. The defense also argued that there's just no way Jordan would have been able to pull this off without leaving any evidence, especially if it was this unplanned thing. Let's walk through what this would have looked like. 
Jordan and Janessa would have been on the couch, waiting to go to school. Jordan would have decided to go upstairs, get one of the guns, load the shotgun, bring it downstairs, shoot Kenzie in the head, very calmly, very quickly go upstairs, bring the gun back up there, unload it, and then leave for school like nothing happened, without leaving any evidence at all. At age 11. That's wild. Is it possible? Maybe. But how can you be sure? How can you just put everything on a theory like that? And the biggest thing that they argued to the Supreme Court was that the police were not able to prove that that gun was even the one that was used to kill Kenzie. There was no way to prove that the real gun might be out there somewhere. Maybe it was someone in a black truck, and maybe they left with the gun that day. That's a very real possibility. And when you have a possibility like that, you can't just convict a child of murdering two people and sentence them to the rest of their life in prison on a theory, you know, without evidence. That's all it is, it's just a theory. There is also no blood found on the gun. There was no blood found anywhere outside of around Kenzie's head. There was no blood found on Jordan's clothes, which is really hard to believe considering this is a shotgun, you know, it makes quite a mess. Jordan's hands were never even tested for gunshot residue. They never even checked the house for fingerprints. So, someone totally could have been in there. The door was just unlocked. There were people working on the property. How can they be so sure that no one else could have come into the house that day and done this? They just can't. There is no way to prove that. And when it came to Jordan's clothes being so clean, not having blood anywhere on him, the prosecution argued that that was because the blowback from the gunshot wound was actually stopped by Kenzie's hair, that her hair blocked all of it. Our theory is that the blowback would have been stopped most of it, if not all of it, from the hair of Kenzie. Which really seems like one of the weakest arguments I have ever heard. So, you might be wondering if they ever interviewed Adeline Moore. You know, she was standing in the doorway when they found out that Kenzie was dead. What did she see that morning? What did she hear? Well, it's hard because she was only four years old at the time, so she was not interviewed, and it couldn't be considered credible anyway. But when she was 13 years old, she did an interview, and she said that she heard something that morning which, at the time, she did not know what it could be. But whatever it was, it was loud enough to wake her up. She said she then went down to Kenzie's room, walked in there, and Kenzie's phone was ringing. So, she answered, and the person on the other line asked to talk with Kenzie. That's when she tried to wake her mother up. She said that her mom wasn't responding, so she tried to kind of push her. That's when she rolled her over and realized she was dead and saw all the blood. I can't imagine what a traumatic experience that was. And when I turned her over, I realized, so I hung up the phone and went outside. But according to her, she walked right outside as soon as she realized her mom was dead. She was so freaked out by the scene that she went outside immediately and started crying. That's when she got the attention of the tree trimmers. This was right around 9 a.m., which means Jordan and Janessa would already be at school. Remember, she said she heard the gunshot go off right before all this, right leading up to 9, that was happening. Jordan and Janessa left for school around 8.15. If her account of this is correct, that means Jordan wasn't even home when the murder happened. Of course, I must point out that a lot of investigators do not believe her story because she was four at the time. I mean, it's hard to really take it as 100% the truth. So, a lot of people dismiss her story and say that it doesn't count as part of the actual evidence, which I understand she was so young. So, in the summer of 2018, Jordan Brown's case was presented to the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania. 
They looked it over for a little while, and then on July 18, 2018, they decided to rule in Jordan's favor. They said that after reviewing everything, they could not prove him guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. So, that was it, Jordan was set free right away. Imagine how he would have felt. Obviously, there were people celebrating, there were people really excited. But there's still, to this day, a lot of people who believe he got away with murder. Kenzie's whole family believes that he was the one who did it. And, of course, no one can say that he didn't do it. There's no way to fully prove that either, but there's no way to fully prove he did. We can't be sending people to life in prison without enough evidence that they have actually committed the crime they are accused of doing. Hopefully, we can all agree on that, especially when you have an 11-year-old in such a murky situation. And, of course, I feel so badly for Kenzie's family and for Kenzie. I wish so badly they could have the answers they need. Chris believes that the real murderer is still running free. He believes that his unborn child and Kenzie were murdered by someone who got away with it and framed his son. There's a murderer walking amongst us that has been overlooked. Chris is still heartbroken to this day that this happened, it has ruined their lives in so many ways. But he's very thankful now to have his son free. Jordan has been able to really impress everybody with how strong he has been throughout all of this. Jordan was able to maintain a 3.9 grade point average and also taught himself how to play guitar. He also played a lot of basketball in jail and has now become pretty good at it. He's such a chill dude for what happened to him. When he's interviewed about this, he says that all this that happened was BS, but you know he's thankful that it's over now and he's out. He has such a positive outlook for going through so much. And, of course, I know there will be some of you who think that Jordan did this, and I would like to hear your opinions because it is a hard one. But I definitely think that, at the end of the day, the right call was made here. Jordan should not have been found guilty of this murder. There's just not enough evidence, period. There's not. Chris is still very frustrated and disappointed with the police for pinning this on his son, and the police stayed very strong in their opinions that they got this right originally. That Jordan really did murder Kenzie and the baby and that he got away with it, but a lot of people have been very critical of the police for being so confident about this with not enough evidence to really back that confidence up. Also, they really didn't have much experience with murders at all when this was all happening, so it's hard to just take their word for it. Kenzie's family, especially her daughters, really miss her and wish they knew what happened so badly. I used to like dance and sing on the fireplace. That was like my favorite memory. I'm just like her. I am her little mini-me. Jordan ended up going to college and studied computer science. Recently, he's gotten into criminal justice, he started taking classes and is interested in potentially becoming a lawyer one day. Not only that, but he specifically wants to work in civil rights. Most recently, in July of 2020, it came out that Jordan and his legal team are suing a handful of retired state police investigators and officials, accusing them of malicious prosecution. So, that is very interesting, and I bet there's more to this story that we can't know about for legal reasons. Jordan and his attorneys say that police manipulated interviews, manipulated evidence, and pushed this false narrative from the beginning that Jordan had done it without any proof. You know, they just kind of went with that narrative from the beginning for some reason. Not only that, but they believe that they failed at following protocol for interviewing children when it comes to interviewing all of the kids involved in this case. There's a department policy that said they should have recorded the first interview. Also not supposed to have had multiple adults in the room during it, and they were not supposed to talk about the case details in front of the children. Absolutely no evidence 
uh, direct or circumstantial that ind indicating that Jordan Brown committed this crime. There's not a single piece of physical evidence. There was no DNA. There were no fingerprints. Uh, there was nothing. The family is also suing them for not pursuing Adam enough. They still think that it could have been him, which I feel like they didn't look into enough either. It's so weird that they were so sure it wasn't him right away, especially because she had that restraining order against him, and it would have been possible for him to do it. Jordan's hoping that this lawsuit will be the thing that really nails his innocence for everybody. He's also really hoping they give his dad some financial compensation. His family, in general, should get something for all that he's been through. So that is all still kind of in the works, we'll see what happens with that. I am curious about your opinions. Do you think the police made the wrong call in the beginning or the right call in the beginning? Do you think it should have been reversed? I know there are going to be a lot of opinions, so let me know your thoughts below. I definitely want to hear what you think. I found this case to be so interesting, it's one of those that just leaves me wondering what happened so badly. But I don't think we'll ever get the answers that we should have. It seems like the crime scene itself just was not processed well enough, and it's a shame when that happens. I feel for Kenzie's family, even though they disagree with how all this turned out and believe that Jordan got away with murder. I disagree with them in that, I still feel incredibly sorry for them and their loss. Imagine how hard this has all been for them. Please leave your thoughts, comments below. Thanks for listening to this episode. We'll be back next time of course to bring you yet another case but until then stay safe out there and please subscribe.